Welcome to STEM Spots, a weekly science review produced in cooperation with the Missouri State University Department of Physics, Astronomy, and Material Science. Hi, this is Dave Cornelison, and you are listening to the webcast version of STEM Spots. With me in the studio today is Dr. Surajit Sen, who's a professor of physics from SUNY Buffalo. Thanks for stopping by, Surajit. Thank you, Dave. It's wonderful to be in Springfield, Missouri. Now, you work on something that's a little different from most of my friends and colleagues, and that is something we could broadly categorize as granular systems. Talk broadly about what that exactly means. A sandbox is a fantastic granular system. We all have played in the sandbox as kids. Basically, when two grains of sand, they press each other, strong forces develop between them. And these strong forces, which can grow quite rapidly, would be a fantastic example of a nonlinear system, in fact, a strongly nonlinear system. So we have nonlinear systems all around us. They're, they're, it, it's not that we, we get an opportunity to learn a lot about them, because historically, these systems have been difficult to study without computers. Even the experiments, which, which may seem rather simple, as to measuring how much force acts between two sand grains or two, for that matter, stainless steel spheres like ball bearings, how how much force that is, it's not easy to measure these things. These experiments can turn out to be very difficult. And so this is the kind of stuff I, I deal with on a day. So when you think about that, so most people think of physics and they think of either Einstein slash Hawking slash black hole, or they perhaps think of lasers and so forth, perhaps electrical phenomenon. Um, when you were to think about this in the average world, you talked about stainless steel ball bearings, you talked about sand, and so the manifestation of this, how you might see something that manifests granular kind of behavior, we would call it, uh, perhaps. What kinds of systems might people want to be looking at in their own lives where they say, oh, this is actually going on in, in the real world around me? That's a fantastic question. So, so I got into this whole granular business pretty much by accident. Basically, what happened was the, there was a professor called Sid Nagel from University of Chicago uh, who gave a fantastic talk on avalanches uh, back in 1991 or so at East Lansing, Michigan. And I was a postdoc at the time at Michigan State University. And I ended up having an argument with Sid. It was a friendly argument. We became good friends, and I learned a great deal about the subject from that time on, and I fell in love with it. So, so the grains were, were my doorway to get into these nonlinear phenomena. So the grains are my sandbox. So so that's part of the answer uh, in the sense that the grains are just one kind of nonlinear systems, but nonlinear systems are all around us. Think about about what's going on when waves crash on the beach. We are very familiar with that. Think about what's going on when mountains form. Think about what's going on when craters form. You look at any heavenly body and you will find there are craters all over them. You think about uh, tornadoes and hurricanes, how the, how the desert sands of s- the Sahara play a role in, in the formation of the, of the terrible hurricanes that, uh, you know, that hit us from time to time, because they all form uh, slightly west uh, of, the, of the Sahara. So all these things are strongly nonlinear phenomena, as are earthquakes. We are all too familiar with earthquakes. So. This is actually all around us. You know, we think about pollution, for example. That's a highly nonlinear problem because how do you get rid of pollution? How do you get rid of particulate pollution? We, we are breathing in two and a half micron particles all the time. Now, in Springfield, Missouri, this m- may not be a big effect, but if you go to New York City, worse still, you go to Cairo, you go to Calcutta, you go to Delhi, you go to Beijing, you go to so many different cities, and what you feel first is that the air feels different, the smell is different, things look a little darker. Why is that? Because there are two and a half micron particles sure. that contain a lot of carbon. That's all so, over the map. So let's think about this a little bit. You use the word nonlinear, and so you've talked about a lot of different possible effects. You talked about volcanoes and earthquakes. You talked about cratering. You talked about uh, pollution. And so what you're saying, I think, is that underlying all of this is a simil- similar mathematical formalism, and the key thing that you're talking about is nonlinear. So when you say nonlinear, talk a little bit more about that. Do you mean that the forces involved are nonlinear? Or do you mean that the potentials involved involved or nonlinear. Talk a little bit about what nonlinear means from your treatment of this as a theorist. What does that what does that add to the system? Fantastic. So by nonlinear, what I really think of is that the force between two objects develops very rapidly as the objects move, typically when they're moving closer to one another. 
So when forces grow very rapidly, when objects move closer to one another, the way energy is transferred from one guy to, to the other uh, turns out to be very special. So this is the hallmark of nonlinearity. How special? Well, nature transmits energy in different ways than normal sound. So we are not surprised by sound waves, right? So sound waves basically is one way in which nature transfers energy from one place to another. It, it can be from me to you. It can be in an earthquake. Uh, it, you know, all kinds of applications of sound waves and manifestations of sound waves are all over the map. So it turns out that in addition to that, nature prefers to propagate sound or prep propagate energy, mechanical energy, uh, in other ways in nonlinear systems. So this is what's special about nonlinear systems. Energy propagation is fundamentally different, and that can have profound consequences in the, in, in, in the events around us that we observe and we deal with. So one of the things you and I talked about just in a conversation was that uh, waves can be involved in this, and there's a particular kind of wave in which you have an interest and that was of interest to many people. It turns out for hundreds of years. And so talk about this, this thing that you call a rogue wave. That, that plays into this somehow. Rogue waves are really, really interesting things. Rogue waves have been, you know, have, sailors have known about rogue waves for a very long time. And it turned out that when the European explorers were sailing out west back in the 14, 1500s, uh, a great many ships were lost to rogue waves. The intellectuals at the time in Europe, most of the mathematicians, the names you hear about, they got very busy studying these these nonlinear waves, which are these rogue waves. They can be very high. They can be 60 feet, 70 feet, 80 feet, 100 feet. And just to give you an example, even today, uh, if a ship is hit by a rogue wave, that ship may be severely damaged and even may go down. So, so for example, a typical large ship is built to deal with 45 to 50 feet waves. That's what I'm told by a ship captain. So that's about 15 meters. You can get waves that can be as high as 100 feet Okay, so 50 feet versus 100 feet near the coast of post Portugal, for example. S so these kind of rogue waves popping up in the middle of the ocean uh, is is not uncommon. There are certain areas that are much more prone to having rogue waves than others. So, for example, if you're in the southern part of South Africa in the ocean there, near the Southern Ocean, where the Indian Ocean and the Southern Ocean meet, that's an area I'm told. Uh, is quite prone to rogue waves. So th there are areas like that that people know it. And the middle of the Atlantic is also one of those areas, apparently, where various kinds of currents collide. To and then, and then nonlinear dynamics could be used in some way to effectively model them? Is that, is that the idea? That's then? correct. So in other words, one reason why these rogue waves form is because very, very large energy fluctuations in these systems can kind of pile up and pile up in some kind of concerted ways such that they create these dangerous waves. So they come and go. They don't last for a long time. They might last for maybe uh, minutes at most, seconds, uh, but not for very long. So they are not very easy to predict. They are not very easy to create in the laboratory in a controlled environment such that we can study them. So what kind of conditions are ideal for generating rogue waves is not really understood to, as far as I know. Still, well, that's interesting. So now let's think about this for a second from how things actually to how things actually get done. So you think about experimental physicists, and as you mentioned, somebody would try to set up, oh, I don't know, some sort of a laboratory system and try to uh, do whatever it is to try to see a granular nonlinear system manifest some sort of behavior. But you're a computational slash theoretical physicist. And so if you actually wanted to attack a problem, take an example. Give me an example of a problem that you've attacked and uh, dumb it down for us so that you talk about, okay, I'll model it, and then I'll attack it with this methodology. How would you go about doing that? So, so you're thinking about this in the context of rogue waves? It can be rogue waves, or it can be another one. It doesn't matter. Okay. If you take a granular chain, so for example, uh, you think about a Newton's pendulum, which would be a whole bunch of typically stainless steel spheres, you know, hung like a pendulum, each adjacent to one another, such that these spheres are touching each other. It's one of these conversation pieces that people keep on their desks. Sometimes, yes? Yes, I right. have one at my desk, which I forgot to bring. So if you now take a pendulum out, take one bob out, swing it outward and let it go, what you find is that the last bob swings out. The last two don't swing out, la the last three don't swing out. But if you took one bob out, the last bob only swings out. It doesn't matter if your pendulum is five grains wide if your pendulum is 15 grains wide or 20 grains wide. So it turns out that the energy is transported 
from the bob that you swung out to the bob that swings out on its own at the, at the very end in one go. So it right. goes like a bundle. So that's a typical feature that you see in this nonlinear system that's relatively uh, easy to check. But by easy, I don't mean to use the word easy lightly. What I really mean is that it can be experimentally done. These experiments are not easy to do, but it can be experimentally done. Now, think about something else. Think about a molecular system. Think about a system where you have various kinds of atoms which are bonded together. And suppose the bonds have nonlinearity in them. Now it turns out that if you excite the system, you can actually end up generating unusually large fluctuations because there are those kinds of nonlinear waves present in these systems. So instead of coupling the energy a little bit to every single intervening atom, you can end up with some sort of massive fluctuation in one place, something like that? Exactly, and that molecule can even break apart. So, so these are things that can happen. So, so they have consequences. Uh, we, we don't really know uh, the extent of the consequences they have. They can have consequences in a biological context, in an evolutionary context, uh, in all kinds of contexts. So these are fully unexplored areas of physics. So from a computational point of view, you're talking about still using Newtonian mechanics, but throwing in terms that are nonlinear in the force. And so talk about what makes this a computationally difficult thing? Is it conceptually difficult? Is it computationally intensive? Uh, you know, what, what makes it difficult? Because obviously these problems, as you've already mentioned, are not easily solvable. And so what makes it, from your point of view as a computational person, what makes it tricky to get this done? That's a great question. Actually, computationally, they are not that difficult to do. So thank God that we have great computers that allow us to do these calculations on a regular day-to-day -day basis. What is difficult is that if you're not very careful, because the forces can be quite large and because the forces can grow quite rapidly and come down quite rapidly, you can incur inadvertently errors in your calculations. Your calculations as a result have to be done with rather high to very high precision, which means that your calculations can take a long time. So many of these calculations, the, the really, the calculations in which we get into uncharted territories in a big way, we have to repeat a great many times and, and, and do extremely carefully. So that's one aspect of it. The second aspect of it is oftentimes what you see coming out of these calculations need to be cast properly. Because if they're not really cast in the right way, you may not be able to take out the information that you probably want to take out of it to understand what nature is really trying to do, because that's, after all, what we are doing. We are modeling what nature is trying to do. So to understand, to get into the mind of nature, if you will, if I may use that word, you need to, you need to understand a little bit about why nature is doing what it's doing. A and that kind of visualization, that kind of depiction that we need to do to be able to extract this kind of unknown territory science is what is very challenging about it. And that's also what's very exciting. Now, that, that brings something to mind. So you mentioned yesterday in a talk that you gave to the physics department, you talked about uh, things that might have been buried in the results that people perhaps didn't wait long enough to see develop or something like this, where people, long time scales might be involved or other kinds of things. So sometimes in physics, we already think we know what the answer is going to be before we ask the question. And so we ask the question in such a way we may be skewing ourselves towards a particular result. So how is it possible to make sure when you're doing a computational problem that you haven't accidentally set up what you're looking for in such a way that you aren't going to find what you aren't looking for, if that makes any sense. That makes a lot of sense. In fact, that has been my learning lesson in this in this game. So I started this work back around 1993 when I was at Michigan State as a postdoc and carried it on as I uh, grew through my career at State University of New York at Buffalo. And one of the things that I learned is that you really need to get into the details. So one of the things that you can do with a computer is that by being careful, you can you can do calculations with extreme precision. This extreme precision gives you an incredible place to work. And when you look into that, you pick up effects that you would naturally miss if you are not being quite as careful about the detail. So in other words, the devil is sitting in the details. Right. So once you look at the devil in the details, you begin to see that little things matter in the nonlinear world. So those little things have big consequences down the road. 
And this is not a new result. This has been known for a long time. So it turns out that little things can have very, very large consequences. And that's kind of what you're looking for. So one has to be, one has to be super careful about, about what these systems are going to do and how, how likely that, uh, something, something might happen, like rogue waves might happen or something, something along those lines may happen or not happen. Because it, it turns out that all those details actually matter. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always very unsure about what to do when I, when I see a beautiful mathematical result on these nonlinear systems, because I know that many of those beautiful mathematical results have a lot of simplification behind them. And my, my detective mind goes, goes wild now trying to figure out what they may have missed, because it led me to two pretty cool discoveries, if I may use the word, by just being careful. So that's been a learning lesson. One, one was I predicted how these waves interact, these nonlinear waves interact, which, which turned out to be quite different than what people thought before. And the other turned out to be what are the consequences of such, such interaction. And that turns out to be a very special state, which people didn't really know. And that special state is actually all over the map. And, and this special state involves large fluctuations. And I gave it a name. It's called quasi-equilibrium. So this was introduced by us back in 2004. And all of that was a consequence of just trying to be careful and trying to figure out what's, what's the devil in the details. Right. So now, most people, when they hear about physics, one of the things everybody wants to know about is, or that they think about, they're worried about, uh, are you guys just uh, in your ivory tower doing this and that and the other thing? So it's great to try to think about ways to tie it to something that could have some sort of impact as so much of physics has. Of course, people uh, that know that are in the know realize that physicists invented the laser and the MRI machine and all this other kind of stuff. But in this particular case, talk about something where you have a possibility of applying this to a, let's call it, quote, useful, unquote, outcome for the average person on the street. You and I discussed some possibilities about energy and some other things. Uh, talk a little bit about those. Let me give you, let me give you something that you may not, have, may not have easily thought of. A great many of us as we age, our hearing goes down. So we start off with, a, with an ability to hear that goes up to about 20 kilohertz, which is, which is quite shrill, shrill enough to almost hurt us. Uh, and something which is almost as fine as the motion of an atom. So our ability to hear is literally astounding. But the fact is that it goes down as we age. Our systems age. So it turns out that oftentimes it can be quite beneficial for us to be able to turn off all hearing. For example, I like to work in the quiet, and, and little noises can bother me. So I really, really, really like to to, to turn off all noise. It turns out that even the best Bose systems that I can buy, which cost quite a bit of money, three, four, five hundred bucks, is not good enough to drown out all the sound. You're talking about noise canceling headphones. That's right. Right. So, so that basically just takes out the noise. What if I could take out all the energy that was going to hit my ears? So one of the things I could try and do is I could try and make a system that basically picks up all the energy that's hitting my ears and dumps it in one particular spot where all the energy then piles up. And then what I do is just simply take out that energy. So it simplifies the problem greatly. We haven't done this work. We have done some preliminary studies. But I can tell you that this kind of a simple idea can have really interesting and good consequences because it could help us uh, achieve complete silence if, if we ever want to achieve complete silence. Unless you, you have tinnitus, which I have. So, of course, uh, yes. then you have some trouble. That's right. And that's a problem that I'm quite aware of because I collaborate with a, with a professor in Buffalo who is a, who is a <laughs> world-famous expert on, on the tinnitus problem. And that's where some of these ideas came from. Well, that's very interesting. So let's talk about that. You're talking about basically taking variable fluctuations that are coming in background noise that would range over a wide frequency range. So in both time and, and frequency, it'll be fairly spread out. And you want to couple it to something so that you can uh, get all that energy to pile up and then just suck it out of the system in some way, shape, or form. So you aren't worried about doing this experimentally necessarily, but you have to first show that there's a theoretical construct that at least mathematically makes sense? Or is that easy to do and the hard part is to actually make it physically uh, a realizable system, which is the harder part? Both are hard, but I, I think, I think doing it, doing it in, in the laboratory is probably harder because conceptually I can see how it's to be done. 
Calculationally, we have established aspects of it as to how it can be done. Uh, there is more refinement and more uh, exploration necessary calculationally. But once these are cleaned up, we can probably come, in, come towards a system that might work. Now there are other detailed questions. For example, if you're using particles to, to get this done, which may be one way of, do, of doing it, what kind of particles do you want? How large do you want to make them? Do you want nanoparticles? If so, how perfect? do those nanoparticles have to be, what material you might want to use, and how these nanoparticles might behave. So once you get into the, into the details of these systems, you have, to, you have to explore how these nanoparticles interact. And the fact is that we know very little about how nanoparticles interact. They are just like grains. In fact, there are sand grains that are in the nanoparticle scale. All you, all you have to do is go to the moon and you pick up some, some moon dust, right. and that's nanoparticle scale. So how these particles interact and how we can exploit those interactions to make devices that can, that can help us achieve things like what I, what I was talking about is by no means easy. And therefore, this is the kind of work that deserves uh, the research funding that is very important uh, because otherwise we can't, we can't develop the basic sciences and technologies. We can't do directed science all the time. None of this stuff that came around for us came from directed science. It came from science that basically came out because we were doing fundamental explorations right. of what we felt needed to be done because there were big things that lay behind. So let's talk about when you train students. So if you have a student, uh, I've done some programming. I'm not a computational person by uh, any means. But at the same time, I programmed in Fortran and C and MATLAB and this and that and the other thing. Are you guys writing uh, your own code from scratch? And if so, what do students need to know? First of all, they need to be physics students and so forth, or at least engineering or something, so that they have a handle on the technical uh, and the technical knowledge behind sort of partial differential equations and other kinds of things like that. And then if you put them in front of a computer and, and you start them on this process, what kinds of things do they have to learn to be able to do what you, what you want them to do? There are two components that my students typically end up learning quickly. The first is Newton's laws. So they need to learn mechanics. Uh, they need to solve Newton's equations. That's one aspect of it that we all learn starting very young uh, as as physics majors or as engineering majors. So I, I have had a fair distribution of physics and engineering majors along my, along my 25, 26 year career so far. Um, it turns out that once they know the physics, the rest of it falls in place because nowadays, uh, most kids, they're very good with computers. So that's not, that's not a big problem anymore. The bigger problem is to get them the right code, okay? so. I find it difficult for them to develop a code that would be reliable and that would be good enough, fast enough to go with. Uh, that's typically not something we can do. So we, so we build on others' shoulders. Sure. So the way, the way it kind of works for us is that over time we have developed some codes and these developments in, in often cases took, took more than a year, even two years. And they were developed by pretty senior senior sure. collaborators and postdocs, sometimes some incredibly talented students who, who were even undergrads. So once these codes were developed, then we polished and perfected and polished and perfected and tested and tested. So ultimately, we have now a constellation of codes that we try to use, which are highly reliable and tested. And some of these codes we have now begun to publish. So for example, there is a paper that's going to appear in computer physics communications that actually for the first time will put out one of the codes we have used, we have developed in-house called Pulstein. So this is just an example. So right now I, I, have, a, I have quite a few students who use Pulstein to even check their analytic calculations, to check their theories, and of course to do, new, to do new calculations. So this is a constantly evolving code. This is not our only code, but this is one of our very good codes that was originally started by a former postdoc back in the early 2000s called Krishna Mohan, who is now a retired scientist from uh, a lab in India. Are you publishing the algorithm or are you publishing the, the full code? And what language is it in if you're publishing the code? The code is going to be published. It's going to be in C++. Right. And the entire documentation and the science and how to test the code and what kind of new results you might be able to generate all of that is there. In fact, we show in the paper that we have generated a couple of new results that have never been known before with that code. Very good, very good. 
Well, you know, we're getting to the end of a, a reasonable amount of time for even a webcast version of STEM Spots. This is quite interesting, and of course, it points to this thing. One of the things you pointed out, which I think many people don't understand, is this subtlety that is behind the interpretation of physical results. You like to have the thing bang you on the head and say, here's the answer, but so many times you must search very, very diligently to try to find the, quote, answer hidden amongst all the weeds. Uh, that's one thing, and I, I think that everything you said means that you would agree with that to some level. Absolutely. And then the other thing is, of course, our job is to also prepare people so that they can take up this journey because when you talked about computational codes i know people that work with uh, various kinds of electronic codes and people have been working on some of these codes for 25 years yes and or even longer where a group has extended what you would call maybe several human careers human human years or whatever you want to call it yes and so there's this sort of wave at some level that we're all on yes. uh, and, and of course part of our job in the university system is to propagate the wave so that's great that you also train students who can move on and do other other things. Thank you. Sir Jed, it's been very great to have you in the studio today. Thanks so much for stopping by. Thank you. And once again, this is Dave Cornelison for the webcast version of STEM Spots, signing off. STEM Spots is available online at ksmu.org.